This is the home of the St. Thomas Academy Experimental Vehicle Team, and this is our Dell Winston School solar car, the first solar car uh, that we have built for that race. We're here in the Houston School District, and this is the electricity lab or the construction facility for the Sundancer solar car. Here we are in Newburgh, New York. We are just completing part of Soul Machine 6. But this is where we started out. I hope that the teams that are thinking about building a solar car will look at this vehicle and say to themselves, hey, we can build a car like that. About 13 years ago, I picked up a newspaper and I saw that there was a, the University of Michigan solar car was visiting a high school across the river. And I, I was a physics teacher and I said to myself, you know, this is pretty interesting stuff, this solar car and solar power uh, material. So I went over there to visit the car. When I looked at the car, I realized that it would not be impossible for us to build this on a high school campus. And it was year 2000 that we built our first true race car. And um, we got on the internet and found Dr. Martz's website at the Winston School of Science. And um, we entered the race that year, and um, we've been racing ever since. Well, I think any school can build a solar car. Uh, all it takes is a group of dedicated students and an instructor that's willing to guide them along the way. Uh, I don't think the technology is overwhelming, but I think it's a reasonable engineering challenge for students. Uh, there's a lot of exploration that they need to do, a lot of research that they need to do, and there's going to be a lot of testing that they need to do. But, and that's the reason why you have a program like this, is to put students in a position where they can take science outside of the classroom and actually explore some of those principles that you talk about every day in your physics classroom or in your uh, science classroom or engineering classroom. Well actually it's a lot of fun because you're excited, it's futuristic, and I think just the futuristic nature itself brings a lot of attention. And I know once you get in looking from the outside in it looks very complicated, but the truth is once you get involved in this it's all extremely simple. It's not rocket science at all. It's something that any school, any team can do. We decided that uh, yes we can build this car on a high school campus and um, uh, that's how we started out, building a model, rolling it around the hallways, um, and um, before you knew it, uh, we were starting to gather materials uh, from local businesses and uh, actually welding a solar car together. This classroom not only is my physics classroom during the day, but it is also the St. Thomas Academy machine shop uh, at night. Our machine shop has got one drill press, one bench grinder, uh, and pretty much where everything is built right here. If things aren't filed by hand, then we just use these two machines. Uh, once again, showing that you really don't need an elaborate shop in order to uh, build a solar car. It looks like something that's impossible to do, building a solar car. But it turns out if you just take baby steps, small steps, you'll find people in a community that are willing to help you with materials, willing to help you with welding, willing to help you with computer graphics, many other things that you need. This is a doable project, a reasonable project, one that challenges high school students to test themselves. You know, we've done a number of different projects in the past, but this is the first real projects that has really pushed us, has made us dig deeper into the research, made us explore different options, made us learn to make things that we had never even thought about making before. I think that this is the kind of project that when kids are finished with, they have a pretty good idea of whether the world of engineering is for them. Uh, it also teaches kids to work through problems. And really, that's a big part of what the Dell Winston race is about, is giving students real world problems to solve and giving them a reasonable time frame and a relatively safe venue to do it in. All right, we'll take the top off. Uh, it lifts off from the car in one big piece. 
Uh, you can see the frame inside. We always start with the frame first. And the reason why is because we want to make sure it's going to fit in the body. So we always build a the full size rolling chassis with wheels. Suspension doesn't always work and the steering doesn't always work at this point. But it is enough of a car where we can start to build a body around it. And then we won't have any interference between parts, especially between the body and uh, the frame, which can happen uh, if you work backwards and build a body first and then try to fit a frame inside of it. You know, the first thing you need for a solar car is the frame. You have to have something that you can pick up, move around, and hang things on, whether it be brakes, steering, wheels, motor, um, a seat. This is our first car. Soul Machine 1, it's a box frame solar car made with square tubing. Square tubing is a little bit easier for the, for the students to work with. Um, it turned out to be a very heavy car, but a very substantial car. A box frame, sort of a roll cage, is the simplest way to start. Just a box frame solar car, uh, maybe two feet high, two feet wide, um, that's supported all the way. What do you make it out of? Well, when we first started talking about designing this frame, we explored a number of different possibilities for frame material. We knew we could make it out of composite, uh, say carbon fiber with a honeycomb core, uh, or we could make it out of aluminum, uh, we could make it out of mild steel, uh, which you can pretty much get off the shelf anywhere, uh, or you can make it out of chromoly tubing. Now chromoly tubing is a unique blend of uh, steel that has a high percentage of carbon and uh, uh, chrome in it, uh, chromoly hence the molybdenum, I'll never be able to say that right, molybdenum, uh, blended in there that makes it lighter, stiffer, uh, and stronger than regular steel. Now, of course, there is a little bit more cost uh, involved with uh, chromoly tubing over, say, mild steel. Uh, but the benefit is that you can cut the car's weight by two-thirds by using uh, chromoly, say, over uh, regular steel. We started our first car with aluminum. Now it's a little bit difficult to weld compared to steel, but you can get square tube aluminum. You can probably get square tube anything. We use square tube. It's not as strong as round tube, but it's easy to square things up on the car. It's really easy to add things and measure and all of that. And I thought that was like a brilliant idea to start with square tubing. Um, so we ended up with a frame that was true and straight and square. And uh, it worked out really well for us. Ever since then, we've been using round tubing. We've used round tube aluminum. And then we gone, we've gone to titanium. But these are starting to get kind of expensive. The material of choice for our frames has always been 4130. Uh, chromoly steel. It's easy to work with, it's very weldable, uh, very tool friendly, uh, and it's very uh, easy for students to get an introduction into working with metals. Uh, all right, this is a piece of chromoly tubing. Uh, it is, it comes in any thickness, uh, any wall thickness or diameter that really you uh, could want to use. What we do with it is we hole saw, we take a regular bimetallic hole saw that we get at a regular hardware store, and we can cut miters right into the end, fish mouse, uh, so that the two pieces will uh, line up. And you can see that uh, when you've got a piece like this and it fits right against a piece like that, you get a lot of contact area, so you get a nice weld along there and you get a very, very strong part. Uh, this is the same tubing that they would use, say, to make uh, a number of different high-end racing bicycles. And just because it's an used in high-end racing bicycles doesn't mean that the regular high school couldn't use it. Chromoly tubing is really easy to work with. Uh, it files, it grinds, it does all those things that uh, you would want it to do. And it's relatively easy to TIG weld uh, once you've practiced a little bit. You're going to be the one that determines, hey, what kind of welding do I have available to me? The simplest welding is steel welding. Um, you can get that done in shops everywhere, or you can have it done yourself. Steel also includes chrome molly. A little bit tougher is TIG welding, and that's going to be aluminum or titanium. Uh, magnesium really isn't, uh, isn't much of a choice. It seems to crack in a very short amount of time with, uh, with wear. In our case, we had to build, had to build a car um, based on our ability. 
we are an electrical class, so we didn't have a lot of composite, didn't have any, and still don't have any knowledge of composite material. However, we could weld steel and aluminum, so that's the reason we went with aluminum versus composite. Um, so we have to, first of all, keep it within our ability. We also recognize the importance of using some composite material, and we have reached out after we've got a car and convinced other people that do have those abilities to come and help us and to teach us how to do that. So at present, we went from an all aluminum car to um, basically a marriage of the two, composite with the array and then the aluminum frame. The newest thing and, uh, is composite materials. Composite means it's made of two things, a fabric such as fiberglass or carbon fiber or Kevlar and um, epoxy. Uh, how good is that stuff? Well, um, NASCAR is using carbon fiber for roll bars now. Um, the bicycle industry is using carbon fiber tubes, uh, as is NASCAR, for bicycle handlebars. Now, both of these things are very serious items on these cars, and um, you can rely on the, the fact that NASCAR and the bike manufacturers have uh, tested and uh, these materials, and they are successful. So the ultimate material, if you were MIT, might be carbon fiber and Kevlar, but it's expensive and um, it's, uh, it's difficult to work with because there's a lot of preparation time. When you finally make that epoxy, it's, you've got about three hours to, um, to have it set up and then it's permanent. And if you made a mistake, and a lot of people do, um, it's permanently mistaken. One of the things that we've done with this solar car is make the body or the outside shell completely out of a carbon fiber, styrofoam, carbon fiber composite. Uh, carbon fiber is maybe a little bit of a mystery of material, sounds exotic, but really, once you figure out how to work with it, it's a material that allows you to shape things however you'd like. One of the hard things to do when you work with, say, aluminum or plastic is put a complex curve into it, one that curves two different directions. Carbon fiber allows you to make things in complex curves. Uh, you can twist things however you want, as long as you're willing to make a mold for it to go into. Well, I think that building a full-size body out of any composite material is a big step. Uh, you know, you have to figure the body alone for a car uh, might take up to eight months from start to finish, including the whole process of making a, a, a plug and then making a mold and then making the part in the mold. Now there's some uh, easier ways to do it and for a school that was just starting out, uh, you could actually just skin some, some foam with some carbon and get a reasonably light, uh, pretty smooth part. And so the world of carbon fiber shouldn't be too scary if you're willing to just dive in and do a little research about it and play with some small pieces first before you start trying to build a full-size part. You got a lot of choices in the design of your solar car body. The first one is four wheels or three wheels. Three wheels is not as stable as four wheels. Go around a corner, more likely to tip over. Where do you put the three wheels? Two wheels up front is best. Much more stable than one wheel out front. But hey, the Aurora car in Australia has got one wheel, one wheel up front, and they're usually second or first place in the World Solar Challenge. Um, but I do not recommend a one wheel front. Two wheel front, fine. Three wheels over four wheels is a distinct friction advantage. You've got one less rolling tire. It's as simple as that. Another advantage for a three wheel design is the fact that um, you only have to drive one wheel in the, in the, in the rear. So um, you don't have to worry about in Australia, they drive on the other side of the road. So the down wheel would be the left wheel. In the United States, the down wheel due to gravity would be the right wheel. So um, uh, if you happen to get on a highway that's a little bit funny, you may not have enough pressure on your drive wheel to go. It happens a lot of times, especially in soft stuff if you pull off the road. So third wheels, uh, three-wheel vehicles um, pretty much always have go. They always have traction. So you got to decide whether it's going to be sta a stable four-wheel or a 
not so stable, but still pretty good three wheel. You gotta watch where your center of gravity is and your center of uh, pressure. I think especially for the first year that you're better off to overbuild a car than underbuild it. I have seen a lot of cars over the years at the Speedway. The ones that are overbuilt, they will make it to the finish line, but if you underbuild one, um, sometimes it's hard to even get to that finish line. You have to go through scrutineering and they really test it. The braking system and the tilt test, and if you've got a weak point, it usually will find it. So you can always reduce the weight easier than you can add to the weight, especially once you get to the race. So if you're ever in doubt, beef it up in those areas because solar cars, it's good to be light, but it's more important to be dependable. I find out that usually the first car that you build is overbuilt and heavy. And um, it's because of that, uh, I'd rather be safe than star sorry routine, which is a good routine to start with. But uh, after a while, you want, you, you want your car, your solar car to be competitive, lightweight, but still stop efficiently, go efficiently, not break down um, during the races and challenges that you might be involved in. One of the toughest and most complex aspects of the car is the steering and suspension. And that's one of the most critical because that's got to first of all turn the car and guide the car and also it's got to support the car's weight. And both of those have to work together. Most cars seem to have a double A-frame uh, front suspension. Double A-frame is just simply two A's with the wheel sticking off the end of that double A frame. The idea is, is when it goes up and down, the wheel stays flat. There's no movement of the wheel. It doesn't move out. It doesn't move in. Uh, that would give you something called scrub and it would be terrible because it, it's extra fr friction. We have basically always been with double A arm design. That has worked well. We first had it made out of aluminum and aluminum didn't work well. It, didn't break, but it bent, and that's almost as bad as breaking. So the double A arm is, you see that quite often in solar car racing. Um, I think it comes down to the material that you actually use to install the double A arm. Now we're using chrome molly tubing, which is a type of steel that you can weld with a normal or regular steel welder. And chrome molly will, um, withstand most of the loads that you put on them from a solar car standpoint. So that's what we use and uh, know that a lot of other teams are using the same thing. However, some teams have been quite successful with aluminum, but we have noticed that when they choose to use aluminum, they really didn't reduce any weight. They had to increase its size and thickness. So uh, it's again, is what you have the means of working with. A double A frame is what you, most cars use. But it's, it is difficult to set up. It's difficult to um, trim out and balance. You can get one off a four-wheeler, an ATV four-wheeler. A little bit heavy, but quite substantial. And it has suspension already on it. One of the biggest problems with A-frame front suspension is your wheelbase. In order to get a large wheelbase, the two wheels as far apart as you can get them on a solar car, uh, you have to build a frame that's going to be bigger. You build a bigger frame to get that stable wheelbase and you're adding weight. So it's a fight between weight and wheelbase. One way to beat it is with a lighter weight wheel. This particular wheel utilizes mountain bike technology. When you buy the front fork, you get everything with it. You get suspension, you get disc brakes, you get disc brakes, suspension, and it's and it's easy to steer with a little bolt-on uh, uh, pieces of aluminum or a little welded-on pieces of aluminum. You can easily steer this uh, structure back and forth. So. It's important because you get axle, suspension, 
breaks, you bought it off a shelf, you can have backups you can buy off the shelf, you don't have to go through all of the manufacturing process. The bicycle area, I know that the New York team and also the um, Minnesota team have been quite successful in using the bicycle parts. Myself and this school, we really don't have a lot of experience with that. I think that would depend upon a person's um, former experience coming in, knowing what their abilities were, what their strengths were before they chose to use a go or a bicycle um, part. But there are many bicycle wheels and even brakes that are used, but you really have to use those with caution because they're not quite as strong as some of the other ones are. One of the things that we've always used is off-the-shelf bicycle parts for pretty much everything that we've ever built. Uh, I think we're able to get away with it a little bit because our car doesn't weigh very much, a little over 400 pounds, spread out over four wheels. I'm not recommending this for every team. As your car gets heavier, obviously you'd want to have a set of wheels on there that can support the weight or the additional weight of your vehicle. You know, almost everything we do uh, has broke at one point, no doubt about it. In fact, that's why I say we know a thousand things that don't work. Uh, I think that the way we usually make linkages and the way we usually put parts together is with a standard uh, eye bolt and a regular bung that we weld right into the end of a tube, a threaded bung. You can put it right in the end of a, a say, example, an A-arm, uh, or the threaded uh, eye bolts that will thread right into that and allow you to have complete adjustability with the part. Certain parts of the car, you can skimp a little bit on, on rod ends. Some of them, you need quality uh, bearings in here. Uh, for example, any part of our car that needs to steer, turn, affects the alignment of the car, for example. We spend a few extra dollars, we get Teflon lined parts, and then there's a lot less sloppiness to the steering as it goes down the road. It's much easier uh, for the driver to drive it straight when things aren't moving around on him. We don't have a regular standard steering box in our car. Ours is all linkage, steers like a tank, if you, if you will, push-pull, uh, right, left hand, uh, all linked together. The suspension is just a typical double A-arm suspension that we, uh, we made. Uh, we haven't completely refined it yet, but we're working on that uh, with a regular bicycle shock in there. I think that the car is intuitive to drive, and I think that's important when you design anything, is that the driver should be able to get into the car and drive it first try. It shouldn't take a lot of training to get a kid to drive the car safely, because in an emergency, they're always gonna to revert to what is intuitive. And so, uh, when we get in there, I, I'm always the first person that drives it, just in case, uh, and I need to be able to get in and make it drive easy and straight and right away right from the beginning otherwise we go back to the drawing board. The suspension is an area that can get quite costly on you so you find yourselves looking into um, some areas that you normally wouldn't such as go-kart technology and that's really not a good thing for solar cars because of some of the speeds involved. We're not NASCAR but we're also not go-kart so you need a little more stability than you would have in the go-kart um, steering area. So I think that's mechanically is one of the most critical part. That in the swing arm, the swing arm, most of them have, which is in the back of the car usually, most of them have a, a suspension area back there that you really need to um, verify your design before you actually build it and install it on your car. This is a motorcycle swing arm. This is off a Suzuki motorcycle. All we've done is uh, uh, put on, uh, put a plate that will hold the original motorcycle swing arm. But notice this, our motor is mounted on the swing arm. The, the reason for that is, this happens to be a Kevlar belt from a Harley Davidson. We don't have to adjust this as the suspension works. If you put the motor on the car and the tire was free to move on its swing arm, it would keep on changing the, uh, uh, the uh, chain length and uh, could possibly slip off and things like that. So it's a very good idea to put your electric motor on your swing arm so you, d you only have to adjust your chain or belt one time. The tires and the wheels are another big choice you have. This happens to be a 
a very expensive hub. It's machined aluminum from a billet. Um, they're costly. They sell for $500, but they're tough. Uh, they're very good. The rubber doesn't peel off the rim on a turn. A bicycle tire is not as substantial, but if you get a double rim bicycle tire, they're plenty strong. The, the tire won't peel off the rim on turns, and um, it's very lightweight, especially in the rotational area. There's less uh, torque spinning this around. This one doesn't spin very well, but there's um, much less to spin, much less weight to spin. You don't have to manufacture the axle and the bearings. It's right here. For us, we use standard BMX bicycle rims. We use some regular hubs and regular bicycle tires for our car. Uh, we have found that these work pretty well. They roll very nicely and they work uh, for our design because we have everything supported from two sides. And so we don't have to cantilever off uh, one side of the axle. We support it on both sides so that we have less twisting of that axle mechanism. A lot of teams will use just one kingpin that just comes right off of uh, uh, say a stub, and they're able to make that work very uh, effectively. Making wheels, finding wheels for that some kind, sometimes is a little tricky. Uh, this has just worked well for us because everything's easy to get. One of the common, common problems for seller cars are they are built light and fragile. It's keeping your tires and wheels aligned, and that's important to do because of not only wearing your tires out, but also from energy losses. You are running off the sun, that's your only source of energy, so anything you can do to minimize those losses. In a race that's multiple miles long, in the case of the Del Winston race, sometimes over 900 miles, one of the most important things that you have to take care of with the design and then ultimately finish work with your car is the alignment. If your car doesn't run straight down the road, if the tires are towed in or towed out, you get excessive wear, and excessive wear means excessive friction, which slows your car down. In our case, we always make sure when we check the alignment that we do it with the full weight of the car on it. So with the batteries, the driver, uh, for example, in there. And then we can adjust both the camber and the caster of the front end in order to make sure that we have the correct uh, alignment. Uh, if everything works together, it should roll down the road smoothly, it should corner with very little friction, and ultimately increase the efficiency of your solar car. One of the simple things to do is to keep your wheels aligned, and this is a program that we have bought. It utilizes a laser beam to better align them. It's important that these wheels be parallel to each other. So using this laser beam, we can actually get away from the tire itself and see much smaller, minute amounts of misalignment. It's exponentially greater out there on the laser beam. So that's one way that we have chose, thing that we chose to do to keep our wheels in line. A well-designed suspension makes it easy to drive, reduces the friction uh, of the car as it rolls down the road, and it lets you get more energy to moving forward uh, from your solar array. Now, when we teachers get together to uh, get a solar car going, we try to get brakes on the solar car. It seems to me that students always just try to make it go. They don't even think about the brakes. Well, what do you need brakes for? We're not going to hit anything. Uh, well, we never let a car move <laughs> unless it's got uh, some brakes, some working brakes on it. And the brakes, uh, turn out to be a big problem a lot of times. You see, uh, your accelerating force on a solar car is not going to bend the uh, A-frame, for instance, on your front wheel. But the braking action, which might be as much as three times the weight of your car, um, could have a serious consequence. And it's happened to us, it's probably happened to all teams that start out with solar car, brake problems. It's a big thing. Not only does it have to stop, 
but it's got to make a serious stop, emergency stop, at 30 miles an hour. There's a number of braking possibilities for your car, and obviously being able to slow your car down is very important. There's a lot of things you have to take into account when you're designing your brake system. Primarily, of course, your weight of the car. A bigger car is going to need stronger, bigger brakes in order to bring it down to a slow speed relatively quickly. The Dale Weston Solar Challenge requires two braking systems, and they have to be separate braking, braking systems um, from a safety standpoint. And um, we have chose to use the hydraulic disc brake system. And um, these are go-kart um, pads here or calipers that we have used. And the nice thing about those is they have springs in there so that when you're not on the brake, it um, completely backs away from the rotor so that when we are driving or racing or running the car, the brake pads are not scrubbing the rotor. Um, these are separated not only mechanically, but also from a hydraulic standpoint. So if hydraulics failed on one, we still have a separate system on the other. We not only have it on the back wheel, but we have it on the front wheel as well. So we have two total, totally separate um, braking systems on the car. And that is necessary because you do want to stop and, and things do happen. However, one of the big problems that we have is we have short and tall students on our team. And of course, these cars are small, they're light and they're compact. And um, we have to be able to get both of those in the car and be able to drive it and be able to stop it. So what we have chose to do from a mechanical standpoint is to design our brakes so that the long-legged stu long students can reach it as well as the short-legged students. And we've done that on both our brake and our accelerator. And that seems like it's worked quite well for us. It is important to be able to stop once you get these things going. There's one other way to do it. Get on the internet and look up mountain bike parts. And those mountain bike manufacturers will tell you, hey, this mountain bike brake can stop a 250 pound man going 60 miles an hour down a 60 degree, 60 degree slope in the Rocky Mountains. Well, if it can do that, it can stop my solar car doing 30 miles an hour. So I believe in this mountain bike technology. We've chosen kind of a unique brake system. These are hydraulic mountain bike brakes that you can mount right to the rim. It's a regular hydraulic system so that when you push on the lever, it causes the pads to hydraulically move in and allows the driver to exert a relatively large force on the rim of the, the wheel, which is a relatively large surface, and bring the car to a stop pretty quickly. Uh, there are a number of other hydraulic systems that are possibilities. There are hydraulic disc brakes that are made just for bikes. There are hydraulic brakes that are made for go-karts or small cars. Uh, we've seen cable actuated brakes, which really are the least efficient uh, and the most likely to suffer over the course of a race as the cable stretches and uh, the like. And they're very hard to uh, have a mechanical advantage with. What we have here on our original car is um, a double system of brakes on the rear. Uh, this is a very large rotor. Unfortunately, it's very heavy, but um, it'll stop our first car. Our first car was too heavy. It was 800 pounds. Uh, a large car needs substantial braking. Uh, we could not have used mountain bike brakes on this vehicle. Uh, I wouldn't recommend mountain bike brakes on vehicles that are more than 500 pounds, 550 pounds. Um, a lot of solar cars don't have any rear brakes. Most of your braking, 70% of your braking is on your front wheels. A lot of solar cars have double sets of brakes on the front wheel. Two independent brake systems. In case one fails, you have to have, uh, the other one will stop the car. That's the rules. You've got to have two independent brake systems on your solar car. Usually, it's going to take three times the weight of the car. Uh, the force of three times the weight of the car is what you're going to have to stop. Uh, and you're going to have to do that at 30 miles an hour. So uh, it's substantial braking. It's for safety. It's got to be done. Do it right.
An important part of your solar car, and perhaps the most important part, is the electrical system. Moving energy from one spot to another as efficiently as possible is what makes a winning solar car a winning solar car. For us, we start with the solar cells, uh, where we take raw cells, we wire them together, we encapsulate them and put the top of the car. Those solar cells are hooked up to a brain for the solar panel. It's a maximum power point tracker. This one is made by the Energy Re or Australian Energy Research Lab, AERL. Uh, they ship them to us from Australia. And they are the best possible way to make your solar cell talk to your motor controller, to your battery systems. When we use the power tracker, we run wires from that right to our battery or right to our motor controller. The motor controller is the part that runs the actual motor of the car. It's an efficient way uh, to send electricity to the motor and lets you modulate it with a low voltage source. The motor controller is hooked right to the motor uh, and it sends the amount of electricity that you tell it to right to the motor. Uh, the normal progression of electricity through your system starts at the solar cell, moves to the, uh, the power point tracker, to your battery and the motor controller, and then from the motor controller, which is modulated by a potentiometer, to your motor. So uh, in the end, the idea is that electricity gets from your solar cells to your motor in as efficient a uh, method as possible. Here it is. This is the gasoline for your solar car. It's a silicon solar cell. This is, it happens to be a four inch by four inch solar cell or a 100 millimeter by 100 millimeter solar cell. They're all, they're all the same. It's silicon that's been doped. You have a P junction and an N junction on it. They uh, take it and they, they solder tiny wires this way and two big wires this way. When you want to connect them together, you got to connect together those two big wires to the back, which is usually all metal, all metallic, to any place on the back. So like most things in a solar car, you're going to be hooking these up in series, positive to negative, positive to negative, positive to negative. Uh, what happens here is the photons come in from the sun, strike the silicon, and knock off an electron. The electron drifts towards the top surface and um, eventually gets to the wires. It drifts slowly, rather slowly, through the silicon. When it hits the wires, it accelerates uh, because the wires are conductors. And then you can use them. Obviously, the more efficient the sails are, the better they are. And there's basically two different types of sail. There's a terrestrial grade sail, which are used here on Earth, things of the Earth. And this is a type of terrestrial grade sail. It's about $8, and this is what most teams use. They come in different sizes. This one's about a four inch square. Some of them are four and a half, five, five and a half, but they're basically all the same type of sail, usually made out of some type of silicon. These things are anywhere from 14 to 16 and a half percent efficient and they're quite inexpensive. This particular sale is about $8 a piece, and there's about 720 of those on most solar cars, and that's what is on our car. This is the other type of sale, which is a space grade sale. Many of the universities and corporations in Australia run this sale. To my knowledge, there's none of these being used in the high school races, and its efficiency is anywhere from about 20% to somewhere around 30%. This one is about 24%. And to give you some comparison of the cost, this thing is about $300 or a little over $300. And it takes over 2,000 of those to cover our car. A bad thing about the space grade sale is once you bought the sale, you have to buy a $6 diode for each of those 2,000 sales. However, it gives you a tremendous amount of power. So um, if you can afford that sale, it's a much better sale, but to my knowledge, none of the high schools are using those things, but it is available. The terrestrial grade sale is where we would recommend starting, and of course, you, again, you can get those in most any size or configuration that you want. The simplest part of the silicon cell is 
It's a half volt potential. Every one of them is, is 0.5 volts. That is to say, if I take this and break it in half, the half will still be 0.5 volts. If I shatter it, each chip will be 0.5 volts. Hey, it's a constant that we can use. We can figure out electronically um, what we need and where we're going with this simply because of that. You may have a 5-inch cell, you may have a 4-inch cell, you may have a 3-inch cell, but they're all 0.5 volts. Well, if you hook one cell to the next, 0.5 and 0.5 is going to give you 1 volt. How many volts do you want? Keep on hooking them positive to negative, positive to negative, and you'll get the voltage that you, uh, that you desire. The area really doesn't affect the voltage. If I were to break this in half, then I would have two pieces, and both, each of those pieces would be at 0.5 volts. However, what changed was the amperage. This thing is at 0.5 volts at 3 amps, but it's dependent upon this total area to be 3 amps. For example, if I were to break it in half, I would now have two pieces each at a half a volt, but only at an amp and a half each. So the area is what determines the amount of current that you get out of them, not the voltage. As we series this, these sales together, that's where we increase, and that's the way we increase the voltage, is by putting them in series. It's very similar to putting batteries in a remote. You have a positive to negative, positive to negative. And of course, as you do that, your voltage is additive. You simply add each of those strings together, and that gives you your total voltage. Okay, here's that uh, four inch by four inch solar cell, the one that gathers the electrons for us from the uh, solar, uh, the solar sun rays, and uh, from the sun rays, here's the uh, panel. You can see that these, uh, the solar cell uh, is just one of uh, the uh, series hookup in this particular uh, panel. Um, usually they've got 36 cells. That's going to mean, at 0.5 volts, that's going to mean 18 volts. Turns out that's rather ideal for charging 12 volt batteries. Uh, what we do is pick a number of these panels to series together to give us perhaps 72 volts in a zone that's going to go to our maximum peak power tracker. We'll then hook up those zones in parallel, positive to positive, negative to negative, and uh, we're going to run them all into one peak power tracker, or if you have more peak power trackers, uh, you're going to get better efficiency. An array is really an accumulation of many, many sales that have been wired in series. The way that you wire your array depends on the motor that you've selected. Some motors work on 12 volts, some work on 108 volts DC. So obviously you've got a huge range and a lot of voltages in between the two. So the higher the motor voltage, then the higher your array voltage normally would be. And that's what determines how many of these cells that you would put in series is based on your motor voltage. Our car, on this car, we have two different zones. The front is one zone and the back is another zone. What we have done is put every one of these panels in series with each other, and that gives us a voltage of 171 volts both 171 in the front and 171 in the back. So we have two different zones at 171 volts. Another option might be that you parallel two of these panels and then put those two in series with all the other panels that have been paralleled. And what that would do is, is um, cut your voltage in half, but yet double your amperage. And again, you have all of those options because you have so many panels. So you can basically get whatever voltage out of these things that you need to better match your system, your motor voltage, your battery bank, etc. Our solar array is made up of 432 individually soldered cells. We have the array originally divided into six subsections so that we could run a 24 volt system. Now we've decided to increase the overall voltage of our system and we've divided it into three subarrays rather than six that will run our 48 volt system. Some of the advantages of running a higher voltage is of course you need less power trackers and there's going to be lower currents uh, through your system. 
Oh, some of the disadvantages, of course, is if you lose one of the segments of your solar array, basically means you only have two thirds of it left, rather than in our original system where we had it divided into six subsections, you'd only use, lose a sixth of your uh, array. Now, luckily for us, we've had some broken cells in the panel, but nothing that has affected the overall output of uh, the array. We haven't had any shorts in there that have forced us to remove a cell and replace it. One of the things that we try to do is make sure that all of the subsection uh, is in one spot on the car, and so it all gets equal and like light. The front part of our solar panel makes up one third of our array, uh, one subsystem, which would be hooked to one of the power trackers underneath. We have a middle section, uh, which receives mixed light because of the canopy and the position of the sun at any given point. Uh, in the day and that's hooked up to another PowerPoint tracker and then the big flat section in the back makes up the third subsection hooked to a PowerPoint tracker and probably produces the most amount of light because it's a big uniform uh, part of the array. It's true that if any one cell uh, is blocked by light that the whole panel suffers as a result. So we try to separate it into sections that we think are going to receive a uniform uh, amount of light. This car has two different zones on its array, and we'll raise it up and show you how we achieve that 171 volts by connecting the um, panels in series with each other. As you can see here, we've got wires ran from each of these little junction box with boxes, which represents a panel on the top side. And the important thing that you want to remember there is if you lose one of these wires because they're in series, you've lost this entire zone. So it's very, very important that you really keep both hands on um, the integrity of your wiring when you connect these things in series. Because again, if you lose any one of those, especially from a wiring standpoint, you've lost the entire rate. We can put bypass diodes and things on the individual panel, and if we shade part of it, that is the only effect, the shaded part is the only affected area. But if you, um, have a mistake or make a mistake on your wiring and lose one of the panels that's wired in series, it's pretty major because you've lost that zone and in our case it's half of the car. Okay, once you've got your solar array wired, then you need to take that voltage and current and put into what's called power trackers. And power trackers are um, very necessary in solar car racing because they optimize the amount of energy that you get out of or get from the sun. And it's simply electronics that is wired between the array and the batteries. And this is an example of a power tracker. And again, this is an electronic device that you take the output of the solar array and wire into this and then out of this power tracker is where you would connect to the batteries. Uh, in our first attempt uh, last year at the Dell Winston race, we chose to use uh, some basic DC-DC converters to move energy from the solar panel to the batteries. Uh, one of the things that we quickly learned is that this is an area that you don't skimp on. One of the things that you need to do is not spend, say, $75 on a power tracker that really is not a power tracker that just converts the voltage for you. You need to spend money on a real power tracker. Uh, this is one made by Australian Energy Research Labs. It really is the power tracker that all of the colleges, all of the high schools uh, use. And the reason why is because when your batteries are full, you still want your solar panel to do work for you. And so what the power tracker will help you do is move energy through the system right to your motor so that you can still get the full energy out of your solar panel all of the time. This is an area that's worth building into your budget right away, and one of those areas that you shouldn't cut, uh, cut funds on. It's a bad thing to connect solar panels directly to batteries because what happens there is you lose about 50% of your energy um, through losses, um, through di the difference, resistive differences of batteries and solar panels. So you really need some electronics to, su to separate the array from the battery bank. This is an example of the um, 
the DC to DC converter or power tracker that it's called in solar racing. This is what we use on each of our cars. They are quite expensive. This is one of the more expensive electronics on board a solar car. This is around $2,000 just for this one. And most cars have at least two of these things. However, these are not complicated devices to wire. Don't let the name and, and the looks of it intimidate you, but it is very, very necessary. This is something that we didn't have the first year that we raced because of our budget. And if you were like we are the first year, then in, in a money crunch, there are other devices that you can buy that will be almost as effective, but not as expensive. And this is another type of DC to DC converter that's used um, mostly in ch as charge controllers in other solar applications, such as traffic signals or message boards, things of that nature. And this thing is about $60. However, you may need two or three of those as well, but still it's not $2,000 like the other. Your efficiencies are not quite as um, high as the custom made um, power tracker for a solar car, but they are um, a pretty good device to use. Okay, the battery bank, of course, is guided by the race rules. Everyone is limited to 275 pounds of batteries. If you go over that, you get a severe penalty. So that's kind of one of the first things that you have to consider when deciding a battery bank. After that, what determines the number of batteries that you use is, of course, the voltage of the motor that you're going to operate. If you have a 12 volt motor, you need a 12 volt battery. You can have one that weighs um, 275 pounds, or you can have one that weighs 20 pounds. That's up to you. And what our students do is go and research the batteries and, and kind of match the battery to our voltage needs. Um, we look at energy density. The truth is, after having done a lot of research, most all battery manufacturers have basically the same energy density. So it's just a matter of how many batteries you need on board a car, and that is determined by your voltage or motor voltage. Well, as you probably know, the batteries in a, in a solar car challenge um, can be charged any way you want before the challenge or before the race. Once it starts, solar only is allowed. That means you can only use your array to charge your batteries. Now, some teams try to park underneath uh, lights in the parking lot at night, but they usually catch them. Uh, if you can't get away with that, it's solar only. So, What's the big deal about charging your batteries? Well, you're using 12 volt lead acid batteries because that's all that we're allowed to use. Those 12 volt batteries, however, are dead at 12 volts, actually 11.9. But I'll say at 12, that battery is dead. So you gotta charge it up to 12.9, I'll say 13, because it's an easier number to remember. You wanna charge at a full volt. Your batteries at the start of that race, the morning that you're starting, you want to be 13 volts. However, if you're not going to keep these batteries for five years, well, you can charge it even more, 14 volts. Some people go to 15 volts. I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to tell you uh, the, what the record is because that's plenty, 15 volts. So if you start that race off with 13 volts, you're doing fine per battery. What's that going to be for eight batteries? A nominal 96 volt system. It's going to be 104 volts. So your voltmeter better read 104 volts at the start of that race. If it reads just 1296, you're not going to go very far. Uh, if it reads more than that, you'll be doing fine. Um, you have to understand that when you're drawing a battery down, when you're taking energy out of a battery, you get a false low that's probably 10 volts. So as soon as you start your car, your 104 volt car, it'll probably read 96 or 94 volts. That's okay, because as soon as you let off any accelerator, it will slowly get back up to what its real voltage is. Same thing if you're charging it. 
stop the car, put the array up, your 96 volt car is charging, it will suddenly read 104. Oh, it's charged, let's go. It's not charged, it's a false high. Just like you get a false low when you're driving it, you get a false high when you're charging it. You ask the battery manufacturers, they say, wait 24 hours, let them acclimate to the temperature. Well, you wait about 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and you get a pretty good real value. Um, but technically, you should wait overnight. Uh, this is our electrical compartment. An electrical compartment might be made up of uh, small Kevlar panels uh, to hold the batteries. These are very strong and uh, lightweight and uh, non-conductive. The batteries that you use, you have to carry through the entire race. If it's the Winston Solar Challenge, it's eight days that you have to carry these batteries. If you can't charge these batteries up in the morning uh, and in the night before, if you can't charge them fully, you're carrying extra lead around that you don't need. So our team goes lighter by carrying less batteries. This is one of the things that we've learned in our racing uh, careers here. Uh, less weight in batteries. Sometimes we carry as little as 125 pounds, half the amount of batteries that you're allowed. You're allowed 275 pounds of lead acid batteries. We carry the amount that we can fully charge in the evening and the next morning before we start racing again. Because if you can't charge them, they're not helping you out at all. One of the things that we spend a lot of time on is testing batteries. It's one of those areas that I think really makes a huge difference in the race if you understand exactly how much energy on a given day you can get from your battery pack. If you know that, you can also figure out how long it's gonna to take to recharge that pack uh, at the end of the day. And you can make reasonable decisions about how fast or sometimes how slow you need to run your car. Being able to make that judgment means that you have a pretty good idea of how much electricity you can get just from your batteries. In order to do that, you need to test the batteries. We've built a small test station with just 12 volt marine light bulbs that we hook up to the battery and then we drain test the batteries to the point where we think we'd be able to take them in a race day. Our test station allows us to vary the amount of current that we take from the batteries so that we can measure the amp hours. Each one of the light bulbs draws about four amps, so every time we screw one in, the current goes up by four. Uh, we can say that we're going to run a race at about 20 amps, for example, or in this case 16 amps, and then we can mod, uh, measure the batteries over the course of an hour, or two hours, or five hours, depending on how long we need them to last, simply by changing uh, the draw that we're taking from the batteries. And we get a pretty nice blueprint or fingerprint of how those batteries work. The problem with electricity is you can't see electrons flowing through a wire. Um, if you could, um, it'd be easy to monitor what's going on. We have to use meters, voltmeters, ammeters to, uh, to see what's going on. Well, they're difficult to, um, to set up uh, and um, sometimes they fail or uh, the wires fail, disconnect. Um, it's difficult to monitor uh, the electricity. Therefore, it's difficult to monitor the energy. So that's one of the biggest problems that um, teams have the driver, getting the information to the team that's going to uh, decide, hey, what is it we're going to do? Are we going to run to the finish? Are we going to slow and, and, and wait, uh, wait for more sun to come up, uh, the sun to get brighter, higher in the sky? Is there a rainstorm coming? We got strategists in the chase vehicle following you, and they're the brain power of the solar car. The driver is trying to feed the information back to them. He's got to see those ammeters and those voltmeters and um, uh, decide uh, the energy coming in, the energy that you started with, and things like that. So Sometimes just use a regular standard voltmeter uh, or just a regular, uh, say, a flukes amp meter uh, wired right into their system. Uh, another device that some teams use is this e-meter, sometimes called a Link 10, uh, that wires into their system. We've played with it and we haven't had great success with it. 
Uh, and one of the reasons why is it forces the driver to toggle through uh, a series of button pushes in order to read the current, the voltage, the amp hour. And the minute you change it, then everything changes because every second your system is continually updating. Uh, it also doesn't seem to work, uh, it doesn't seem to like the solar side of it because it tends to mess up the built-in uh, computer program that's in here, the Pukert's equation, which helps you figure out how much battery uh, you have left. Uh, I know some teams are able to make this work successfully. We haven't had very much luck with it. One of the ways that we like is with this simple monitor. This monitor, this, this made by Bruce Sherry, uh, allows us to measure the current that's going to the motor it allows us to measure the voltage of the system. It tells us how many amp hours we've taken out of the battery and how much time we have been running uh, the battery. This is a pretty slick little setup. It's easy, it's about $300, uh, and it works every time. It hooks up to a shunt in your system uh, and uh, really makes a huge difference for the driver because it gives him all of the information he needs right on instantaneously so that he can relay that information to the pit crew, the pit crew can make, help make him help him make good decisions about driving the car. Speed up, slow down, uh, something like that. Okay, what makes it go? <clears throat> What's the part that uh, pushes it down the highway, gets you up the hill? Well, it's the motor. Motors can be as simple as that advanced DC motor, uh, which is probably one of the cheaper motors you can get. That are the brand new, but maybe out of production, uh, E-Tech motor, uh, which has proved to be quite a phenomenal little motor, all the way up to the very expensive NGM, new generations motor, a hub motor. You don't want to undersize your motor. You don't want it to be oversized either. Basically, in solar car racing, we size the motor by the weight of the car. If you got a thousand pound car, then you basically need a motor that's engineered or designed to propel a thousand pound car. Obviously, you would not want to put a very, very small motor on an extremely heavy car. If you did, the motor's not going to last. So weight is a major factor in sizing your motor. Um, and that's what most teams size their car by, or size their motor by, is the weight of the car. Um, most of the manufacturers that supply these motors understand that, and they supply them to you based on the weight of your car. So if you've got your car designed and you, you, you know basically the weight of it, or at least within 500 to 1,000 pounds of the weight of it, um, they can sell you a motor or, or supply you a motor that will fit your needs. Well, let's start with the cheapest motor, the most inexpensive motor, um, the motor that's not mo the most efficient use of your precious electrons that you get from your array. That would be a motor uh, such as an uh, advanced DC motor. It would be a series wound motor. It would have brushes on it, which uh, as uh, the rotation occurs, they put a drag on the motor that you have to overcome, uh, a frictional drag. Um, they don't have permanent magnets in them. This is the simplest motor that you can get. Uh, it's an advanced DC motor. It's a uh, very substantial motor. We've never had this, anything go wrong with this thing. We've had this thing... Uh, so hot, some of the insulation was dripping out the bottom, and we used the fire CO2 fire extinguisher to cool it down, and it still kept on running. This is an example of probably the most um, conventional type motor used. It's the old standard brush type DC motor. This is one happened to be manufactured by the Scott. Um, it's an extremely popular motor for solar car racing. It's a one-horse design, probably be used on a car that weighed somewhere around a thousand pounds or less. And um, it has pretty good efficiencies, and, and um, I think this individual motor runs at 24 volts DC. And this is another example of some of the later type designs that's coming out. It's called the pancake design. This is an E-Tech motor. It comes out of England. Um, the biggest advantage of this is the design of the motor um, internally. It's a little more efficient than the other. 
It can provide you with, with the same amount of horsepower with less energy. So that's what makes it desirable. It's a little more expensive, just by a couple of hundred dollars, but um, the efficiency makes it more desirable for solar car racing. Okay, and our next motor, or the last motor, is the Lemco motor. It also comes out of England, and um, it too utilizes the pancake design. And um, this is the most expensive of this type of motor, of the pancake designs. And again, it's simply because of its internal windings and configuration. Um, this motor is about $1,800, but it's, it's extremely efficient, especially compared to the other two. But it's also a little more expensive. The E-Tech motor is somewhere around $500, and the Scott motor is probably somewhere around um, $250 to $300. So it depends on your budget as to which one of these you can use. They're all three um, good motors, but again, as the price increases, usually the efficiency of the motor increases. Searching around, one of our favorite motors, and the one that we've chosen to use, is a pretty basic, pretty inexpensive motor called the Briggs & Stratton E-Tech. Uh, it's funny that the gas motor company Briggs & Stratton would design and build a pretty efficient little electric motor. This motor weighs about 25 pounds, uh, it's, pancake, it's a pancake motor, it's about 88 to 90 percent efficient, and it seems to be relatively bulletproof. Uh, we have hooked it up wrong, we've put it in very high heat, we've put it under huge loads. It seems to hold up pretty well. It's easy to gear. In fact, for us, regular chain drive, which means that we have to account for the gearing between the rear wheel and the motor. Because this motor is efficient at a certain uh, RPM, we are always playing with the gear ratios in order to make the car as efficient as possible. So we might make the bigger gear in front, smaller gear in the back, depending on what we want the car to do. Figuring out that range, the range that you think that you're going to run your car is important so that you can set the gearing up so that you can get the most out of that motor and the most out of your electrical system. The V-belt design was the first that we used and we found that that's the worst design because it takes so much tension and you have quite a few losses through a V-belt design. We think if you're going to use a belt, you need to use the very flexible, lightweight notch belt or timing belt. That way you don't have to have so much tension on your motor and, and gearing mechanism plus you don't get the slippage out of it because it's a timing belt. However, we've discovered that the chain is probably the most efficient. However, the chain sometimes gives you a little more vibration. It's a little noisier than the belt is, but it's a quite efficient and dependable setup. Um, the chain, as well as the belt, can be undersized and oversized. So you just need to get some of the torque characteristics and load characteristics of both the chain and belt once you decide those. But research those good because each of those has trade-offs. Okay, as you can see right here, this is our chain that we've installed. Of course, it runs from the motor down to the wheel. And it, um, initially, we had a belt drive system there. We had a lot of issues with that. The belt would slip, it would get hot, and it would break, and it would twist, and that type thing. So we went with the chain system. The chain has solved all of those problems. However, it's a little bit heavier because we've had to go with a steel pulley instead of an aluminum pulley. But the weight has been a plus for us because we, we haven't had any breakdowns with that. Plus, the chain's a little more efficient. The downside of that is it's a little bit oily, it's a little bit dirtier, and it makes a little bit of noise as we um, travel around the speedway, but we can put up with that. What's the ultimate solar car motor? Well, it's controversial, um, but certainly an expensive NGM hub motor uh, is one of the top motors that you, can, uh, that you can use in your solar car. Why a hub motor? Well, the motor, the electric motor, is built into the wheel. It's built into the wheel, it has permanent magnets, and uh, it's also um, brushless. It's, uh, uh, the reason you have it uh, in the hub is because uh, you're not gonna have any transmission losses, no chains, no belts. If I put this on the side, uh, what you have to do is mount the motor 
onto, um, onto your vehicle, and then the electric motor turns the wheels. There's no brushes and there's no transmission. All of those things are losses and enables this thing to be maybe 97% efficient, at least 95% efficient. Okay, after we've wired the batteries and have a battery bank, then we're ready to take that energy out of the batteries and supply it to the motor. However, you would never directly connect a motor straight to those batteries. If you did, you were always running at a high rate of speed and it would be really hard to control um, and also be very unsafe. So we put in between the batteries and the motor what's called a motor controller. And the motor controller sim simply gives us the ability to vary that voltage or to vary the speed of the motor. And it also gives us the ability to limit the amount of current that that motor uses. And of course, that's big in solar car racing because you want to minimize the amount of energy that you're um, using to run a car because you only have a limited amount to begin with. The motor controller tells the motor what to do according to your accelerator, your foot, the driver's foot when he pushes on it, lets off on it. The accelerator uh, tells the motor controller, gives the motor controller a signal, and you pull energy uh, from the batteries or from the array or both. Okay, the motor controllers are all essentially the same. The biggest thing you have to keep in mind there is the amount of current that your motor is going to use and also its voltage. Once you have selected the motor that you're going to use, find the voltage of that motor and the maximum current and those two um, figures are what you use to size your controller. Basically, your motor controller needs to be sized to the motor that you are using. And this is an example of a Curtis controller. And um, you find this on many, many solar cars that's used, especially in the Dale Winston Solar Challenge race. Um, it's very versatile, very dependable. You almost never have any trouble out of them. Um, it allows you con to connect your accelerator directly to this controller and of course the accelerator is what determines the speed of the car. Regardless of which one you choose, they all basically wire and do the same thing. Each of these terminals are basically the inputs and the outputs. You take the voltage input to two of the terminals which is simply positive and negative. And then out of this controller you take another positive and negative from there to your motor. And what the controller does is simply breaks that voltage internal and then supplies it or limits how much can actually get to the motor. It also has some small terminals here. One of those is simply the key start that excites or initiates the voltage to begin with. And the other is for a 5K or a 5,000 ohm pot potentiometer. And that's where you bury the speed. That's where your accelerator connects. Uh, this is an all tracks com controller. Uh, this is what we use to go along with that Briggs and Stratton motor. You can get it in a number of different voltages. Uh, in our case, we run a 24 to 72 volt uh, controller, and I think it's a 400 amp max. So that's well above anything we hope to ever use. It's easy to hook up, it's completely programmable. You can hook your PC right into an RS232 slot in there uh, and change the parameters of the control how fast it speeds up, how fast it slows down. It gets its signal from a regular 0 to 5K pot potentiometer, uh, variable, variable resistor. Uh, we use a couple of different forms. Uh, for the driver, we have a regular dial pot on uh, the, the dash that he uses with an on-off dead man switch. But one of the best things that we found is this little variable 5K pot that's spring-loaded, goes right on the handlebar, and makes it really easy for the driver to control the car. Here's an example of it. It's spring-loaded, so it automatically returns to zero. It already is made for a regular handlebar system. You could actually cut this out and modify it to fit on your steering wheel, for example. Uh, if you needed to, you could probably even modify it into a foot pedal of sorts for your driver. It always returns to zero, so it satisfies the release or the dead man switch part of the rules. Uh, this part is maybe $15 or $20, uh, and it's uh, pretty much all wired for you. A little snip, wire it to your controller. Uh, works like magic.
what you what you have here is three parts to the electrical system. You've got to connect them together. You're going to need a good size cable. The larger the copper in the cable, the less the resistance is. Of course, they could get he pretty heavy, so you have to work it out. One of the advantages of using a higher voltage motor is your wire can be smaller going to that motor because voltage and current are kind of in relation to each other. As your voltage um, increases, your current decreases. So you certainly have advantages of using a higher voltage system on a car so that your wiring can be much smaller and, um, and not adding the additional weight to your car. There's a lot of different types of wire that you use on board. Of course, your solar array, the wiring there doesn't have to be as heavy as the wiring that you use on the motor. But each has to be sized accordingly and each has to be protected. And every wire on your solar car, whether it comes from the array or goes to the motor, needs to be protected either by a fuse or by a breaker. And most cars have multiple sizes of fuses because there's different currents and things that are used all throughout the car. The most important thing is, is to size the fuse and wire together. Every wire should be protected by the appropriate size fuse. Breakers basically mostly come in AC. If you were able to find a DC breaker, it would be huge and bulky and extremely expensive. But the electric vehicle manufacturers will supply you with the appropriate breaker for your motor. And don't panic if you see that it's AC. We often use AC breakers in DC, but when you do that, you have to, um, you have to adjust for the current rating. 150 amp AC breaker is certainly not good for 150 amps in DC. So you have to have that adjustment and they are very engineered to a certain motor. What we recommend doing is buying these things in a kit where that you get your motor, um, your overcurrent protection all provided to you in the same kit. That way it takes the guesswork out of it. You get a properly sized breaker for that motor and properly sized wiring for that motor and breaker system. The greatest failure in solar cars, and it may not be a catastrophic failure, it may just be um, a loss of energy, is this connector right here. When you connect one thing to the other, you want to clean it, you want to make sure it's a strong bolted connection. And if you do that, um, you'll probably end up with a winning solar car because dirty connections, loose connections, are probably the most common, uh, not complete failure, the car still runs, but failure in efficiency, failing to get those extra 10 miles, 15 miles, failure in the competition. We have talked about all the motors and the batteries and controllers and the wiring, but truth is we have to take this wire and connect it to those, all of those components. And as you do that, you need to make certain that you're in, the integrity of your wiring is sound. And um, one of the main ways that we do that is use the proper lugs. And this is the type of lug that we get. It's supplied by KTA Services out of California. It's made for electric vehicles. And what that means, it's beefed up in the key areas that they have found over time that tends to fail on us. It's heavier, it's thicker and um, it's designed with vibration and with um, harsh road conditions in mind. This is an example of one that you would get at your local parts store. It's just much lighter. It's not made for extreme severe conditions, duty. Um, it will work, but it's not quite as good as the other one. And of course, this is the least attractive of all of them because of its, um, its very cheap, one of the cheapest um, made lugs that you can buy. It has, it has its place, but not in solar racing. Right, you know, it's that old rule of something can go wrong, it will go wrong, and it's certainly gonna happen here because we're putting in, putting um, not only the car, but all the components and the wiring in some pretty extreme um, situations. I've seen teams come out there and have their wiring taped up. Well, when the tape gets hot, then it loses um, its strength, and there your wire is hanging. Before you know it, a hole or the insulation is worn and the wire is shorted out and maybe it's blown the fuse or, or it's just simply not working at all. It's burned the wire in two. It's just um, taking pride and taking time to manage your wiring system 
using the proper things to manage it, to tie it up with, such as cable ties or cable routes or the spaghetti route that we sometimes use. Um, that's so imported in solar cars. One of the race rules is that we have um, motor disconnect and battery disconnect switches. Those switches have to be accessible from both inside and outside the cockpit. So as you install your switches, you want to keep that in mind and make that easy for the driver to um, access as well as easy for your pit crew to. Those are basically safety switches. If something were to happen, if um, you know, the driver passed out, well, the people outside would need to be able to disconnect that power from a safety standpoint. And the same thing true if the car were, if the controller um, went bad and just energized unexpectedly, um, they have to be able to disconnect that controller or those batteries from the motor. The uh, electrical parts are usually located in, a, in an area in a car where they're not going to get wet, they're not going to get rained on, they're going to get protected. So in this particular case, we've got that uh, area right behind the driver. Uh, first of all, the driver is, will, can be easily prote protected with a firewall of some kind from the batteries, from moving batteries, from acid splash, from uh, high voltage cables and things like that. We try to make uh, sure that the driver compartment has only low voltage wiring around it. Uh, that includes the meters and the switches and everything else. Um, everything, everything should be remote controlled to the high voltage, which is uh, uh, more dangerous than the 12 volt system for the horn, the uh, directionals, the hazards, and things like that. The biggest thing on solar cars is the battery bank. You know, your array puts out a, quite a bit of energy and it can hurt you but the most energy that we have on board cars are in your battery banks. Even though we have switches that disconnects the battery banks from the array, from the motor, from the controller, you cannot disconnect a battery. You, the only way to disconnect a battery is to drain it. And to drain a battery is a tremendous amount of energy. So anytime the students are, you're, that you're working around a battery bank, you need more than one person present and you need to always use the one hand rule because um, that's usually when you get electrocuted and the run, one hand rule is to keep one behind your back and only work with one. That prevents you from getting across the positive and negative at the same time. Just understand that that battery bank is always energized regardless of the position of those switches. One of the things that you always want to do is make it easy for the driver to drive. Uh, so we try to put everything near his hands so that he doesn't have to feel around in what would be our pretty dark cockpit uh, in order to find things like turn signals, horns, uh, hazard lights, those things that you would need in order to drive any car safely down the road. We always try to make the controls, the brakes, the throttle easy and intuitive so that the driver doesn't have to think twice about how to stop the car quickly or how to move the car or accelerate the car away from danger. Anytime that you are putting a high school student in a car that probably weighs less than a thousand pounds and then putting him on roads with other cars that weigh significantly more, safety has to be a key concern. Mechanical safety in the form of braking means your car's got to stop at around 30 miles an hour in an emergency stop. Um, it's got to stop without folding up, without the wheels falling off, falling off, without things bending. It's got to be able to do this repeatedly. Uh, so braking and safety are uh, very important. Uh, the mechanical aspects of the car uh, whether the wheels uh, bend, uh, whether it supports the driver, the driver's protected from the road, uh, his uh, safety harness and things like that, are they firmly attached to the car? Is there a roll bar in case this thing goes over uh, that's going to protect the driver? Is there a crush zone if the driver should uh, run into something or something should run into him? Of course, that Crest zones is the most important part because that's what protects the driver. And you're required to have both rear, side, frontal, and then rollover protection on each solar car. And our crest zone basically in the rear, we've got it extremely beefy because of the triangular design and that's where it comes to the most aggressive point. Plus the suspension, or not the suspension, but the drive train and all is back there. So it's beefed up for that. And we can take a pretty good collision from the side and and it never get to the driver. 
And being a triangle, it's designed to crush out instead of crushing in on the driver because of the shape of it. On the side, the way we achieve that, even though the front and the back of the car lifts up, we have a crush zone that totally um, protects the driver from the side that's tied to the structural part of the um, car and it doesn't move. It's welded out of very thick and rigid material. And obviously, along with those crush zones, we have the roll bars here as well. We also have the three-point safety harness that keeps the driver in place in case it rolled over so that he would remain inside the um, roll bar protection. And as you can see around front here, we also have some crush zones built in that's um, pretty beefy. We decided and selected a very rigid front end that serves as the, also a side crush zone along with the kind of the frontal area as well. And all of that is tied together in that same triangular shape so that if it did impact something, it would crush out instead of in. And hopefully through all of that, the dri driver remains safe and is protected. The crush zone, again, from the front of the car, it's gotta take five Gs. That means five times the weight of the car. From the, from the side, it's gotta take three Gs, three times the weight of the car. So if your car weighs a thousand pounds, you've gotta have a crush zone that's going to absorb and stop 3,000 pounds from the side, 5,000 pounds from the front. If it's only 500 pounds, all you have to stop is 1,500 pounds from the side. You can get that by turning your car over on the side and putting 1,500 pounds of weight on it and see what happens. Okay, we had talked about the crush zones protecting the driver, but sometimes it's also important to be able to get the driver out of the cockpit, be able to regress quickly and safely. And one of the race rules says that we have to be able to get out within 15 seconds. And that means getting out of your harness, out of the cockpit, and totally clear the car. And um, that's one of the major considerations as you build a solar car. Go. Eight seconds, eight, four. On key areas, the suspension, the safety of the driver, um, we use all grade eight boat bolts in those areas. We don't use any, um, or almost no lock washers. We use lock nuts or um, castle type nut where we have a safety pin in those things because they will, they will be really tested and um, we don't use any mild steel in those areas. We use both chromoly tubing and grade eight bolts in those areas. And since we have begun doing that, we've never had them to fail. There's a huge difference in a standard hardware bolt and a grade eight bolt. And the difference is failure or, or a very sound um, suspension for you. One of the most exciting parts of building a solar car is looking for parts that aren't made for cars. Uh, our canopy is a great example. This plastic bubble was actually made for recumbent bicycles to keep the wind off of the rider. When the first time we saw one, we thought, boy, that would be a perfect canopy for uh, one of our vehicles. And so we bought it and we were able to incorporate it into the overall design. You can see that it's optically clear, it's Lexon, so it's relatively strong to protect the driver, and the shape is fairly aerodynamic. It gives the driver a large field of vision, and it allows him to see what's ahead as he goes down the road. You know, you can have a lot of fun with um, deciding on what things to use on your solar car. Uh, you can be very creative in choosing um, uh, different parts of the system. Uh, a lot of these parts come right out of a hardware store. Some, some teams use um, lounge chairs as seats. This chair happens to be um, out of my classroom. Uh, don't tell anybody. This uh, steering wheel is uh, from a uh, racing shop. It's just a regular uh, steering wheel that they put on some race cars. We've got a hinge here that somebody took off one of the doors and uh, it's used to lift the steering wheel up and down to make it easier to get in and out of the car. Local motorcycle shops have wrecked ATVs, burned out ATVs, have got 
parts that sometimes they're just, they're just willing to get rid of. We found out, I found out that there's a thing called a motorcycle junkyard. I never knew that before. They actually had a, a field full of motorcycles. They said, well, come on in and get anything you want. Take whatever you, we went in there and got a bunch of wheels and rims and brakes and things like that and, um, and, and started, started to put them together. This part, finding unique products to use in your solar car, may be the funnest and most exciting part. Uh, internet, uh, surplus stores, uh, even your local hardware store are good places to think a little bit outside the box. The solar car has quite a few different parts. Um, the the uh, batteries and charging, the brakes, steering, suspension, the motor, and then you've got the electronics and the series electronics, the, the peak power tracker, the motor controller. How do you divide that stuff up? The mechanical stuff, the electrical stuff, rolling tests, um, computers to, uh, to start the design, computers to monitor your energy when you're racing. Well, you'll find out that you've got some students that, are, that lean in these uh, various directions. You just mention things to them and usually um, you don't have to worry about who's going to be working on what system in the car. Other times you've got students that are shy and you just keep on, hey, you know, you pick up that wrench and you do this, or you do that, or you, here's a voltmeter, get the reading on those different batteries for me, and they just flow into that uh, particular thing. But uh, uh, the, uh, the best thing for me as an advisor, a teacher and advisor, is to watch uh, how enthusiastic the kids are, uh, I call them kids, the students are, to, um, to solve these little problems on themselves if you just get out of their way. That's right, adults, get them hooked and then get out of the way. Uh, we know a thousand things that don't work. Uh, I think that's partly uh, why we, we have been as successful as we have been. Uh, we've been able to eliminate a lot of the bad ideas by trial and error. We, we have a book that we keep of all of our past mistakes and every time a new student comes up with an idea and says, I think this would be a great idea, we look in the book and we find out that it wasn't a great idea before and it probably wouldn't be a good idea now. Uh, I let the students make mistakes, I think that's important. I try to be involved when it's going to take too long to fix after we've tried it or if it's going to be too expensive to break. Uh, so we. We try to make decisions based on cost. I think that's uh, always going to be an overriding factor in anything that, uh, anytime you work on a project of this magnitude. And time is the other mitigating factor. You have to decide how much time is it going to take to make that dream part that uh, student X thinks that uh, would really make the difference between winning and losing. As far as um, a new team building a solar car goes, um, a lot of common sense is used by the uh, advisors and the sponsors who are helping the teachers out. Um, a lot of trial and error. Now, there's nothing wrong with trial and error. You might be surprised to find out that IBMs and General Motors use an awful lot of trial and error themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've got computers and they can plot out a lot of different scenarios with these massive, large computers that they have. But let me tell you the truth, you talk to some engineers and you'll find out that a lot of it is still done with trial and error behavior. If something falls off, you're going to have to fix it and there's something wrong with it. Something breaks when you're, when you're testing it and it's going to have to be fixed. That's a trial and an error. And um, everybody, every team goes through it. You generally see among winning teams, they have a lot of management in place. They manage not only their car, but how they wire their car. Um, they're able to go there quickly and troubleshoot it and, and pinpoint and find a problem and um, have room to correct that problem. Um, they don't just run things at random. They have some type of plan, some organization in place that allows them to um, implement that plan and, and be able to go back to it in the future. One of the great things about the Dell Winston school race is that teams realize that they are working together to reach a common goal. Uh, there has never been a case where I've seen a competitor keep a secret close to the vest, for example. Uh, it is an open sharing of information. 
Teams recognize that the only way for the whole contest to get better is for everyone to improve. And so they share information open, openly, they share parts, they share tools, uh, they share expertise, so that hopefully your program, as well as my program and anybody else's program, at the end of the contest is actually better than when we got there at the beginning. It's something that any school, any team can do. If they have the dedication, the passion to do it, they can certainly make it happen. And I think you'll find where the students get excited, get involved, involved in it, and the thing will just kind of take shape and it'll evolve over time. It's certainly something that any school can do. If ours have, has done it, I think any school in the nation, because we're an extremely small school, small community, and it's definitely worked for us. Why would you want to enter a race? Well, entering a race is all powerful to a solar car team. It just brings everything together. It forces you to meet deadlines. Uh, it introduces your students to other teams, other teams that have done fantastic things to their solar car that you can copy and steal the ideas from and use them on your car. And guess what? The other team doesn't mind. They'll tell you anything you want to know. They'll tell you how to help your car. They'll even keep your car going if you have a breakdown. So this networking thing with other teams that you get out of races and the experience and deadlines, geez, we got to we got to get this car, we got to practice with this car, we got to get to scrutinary, we got to pass the brake test, the dreaded brake test, and uh, mechanical test, and the electrical test. And um, it's just uh, a, a race is something that these students will never forget for the rest of their life. Now think about that. Some of these students are 16, 17 years old. It's, it's something they'll carry with them for the rest of their life. That's the kind of experience that it is.